continue. The content of the lecture of today is this. So uh, what uh, is the meaning of such a statement will be cle made clear during the lecture. So let me uh, start again by summarizing uh, what can be uh, a general scheme for quantizing fields in globally hyperbolic manifolds. So you have a globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifold, a manifold with a Lorentzian metric, which can be globally foliated by Cauchy surfaces. Okay. This is the global hyperbolic. The uh, Lorentzian structure of a uh, globally hyperbolic manifold uniquely fix the commutator, which you can write with the letter E or with the letter C for commutator. You find this way of writing in general uh, manifolds, rather you find C in Minkowski space time. This uh, distribution is a distribution. Even if we speak about functions, we are always intending that there are generalized function distributions. This distribution is uniquely related to the Lorentzian structure of the manifold, provided it is global hyperbolic. And this gives for you the commutation relation of the field, written in a covariant way. So this is the canonical algebra. One is the uh, identity in your algebra. Of course, it's not an algebra of bounded operators. If you want an algebra of bounded operators, you have to consider the exponentials of such fields. So this is the first step in quantizing a linear field. Not really. We are not. I'm even not assuming that the manifold is analytic. It is infinity. Can have no analytic continuation at all, for the moment. What do you mean by Euclidean signature? This is not. Uh, this is uh, 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 pertaining a uh, uh, an hyperbolic partial differential equation. So you really need to have one sine plus and n minus one sine minus. So uh, you apply here the theory of uh, uh, solving a Cauchy problem, an initial data problem. When, when you do this on, the, on a Euclidean manifold, you study elliptic problem, which is another category of problems. There are situations in which you can join the two things. But it's not always the case. I don't know if I answered your question. What do you have in mind? You have some other unicity theorem you're yes. thinking? Yes. But the, of course, there are, in, uh, there are a solution of a Laplace equation on a, on, a, on a Riemannian manifold. It's also unique. But you may not have the bridge between the two. So this is the first step. 
Now comes the second step. The second step means representing these things as operators in a Hilbert space. So you need a Hilbert space. Who gives a, a Hilbert space to you? So look here that I write here 1 H is the identity in the Hilbert space. One way of constructing an Hilbert space amounts to finding a way to write the commutator as difference of a two-point function and its permuted two-point function in such a way that W is a positive definite two-point function. Okay. If you are, if you have been able to find such a two-point function, one two-point function like this, you can build the one particle in the space this way. You can build the symmetric Fox space out of of this, and you can also build a field operator phi which I write uh, here for you, which is sum of a creation and annihilation part. And the creation part act on an element on the Fox space, C, Let's look at this n particle component this way. So it's 1 over square root of n, the sum j that goes from 1 to n, f of x, j. You see, it's written in x space. It's not a momentum space expansion. C n minus 1, x1, xj is not there, xn. So this is the n minus 1 component depending on n minus 1 points, and you, you build the symmetrization with the creation of the function f. And the destruction part the n component is uh, square root of n plus 1, the integral w of x and y, f of x, c n plus 1 of x, x1. This function is totally symmetric. You integrate over the first point. And you can check that this field satisfy the right commutation rules in this box space. So this two-point function contains everything about the quantization. Give yourself a two-point function. You have a, a Fock type quantization. Check that this formula gives, give, this formula gives the right commutation rules on the symmetric Fox space over the one particular space, okay? You've written this in X space. You don't use uh, any Fourier transform here because it may be that Fourier transform is not there at all. So as an exercise, check that this formula gives the right commutation rules so the point is that acting, if you solve this problem, you have quantized your field in a Fox space. Okay, I'm not telling that the quantization is 
uh, irreducible. I don't telling any anything. Any other property has to need to be studied, but you can summarize the problem of quantizing a field in the sense finding an Hilbert space representation of the commutation rules is reduced to find the problem of finding this splitting of the commutator into two parts. Okay. So now we are going to let me tell you again one more uh, one more time that since the commutator is uniquely fixed by the geometry you have no choice about the commutator when you give yourself the manifold and the metric if the, if, the, if the manifold is globally hyperbolic. So you can write W of XY equal one half of its antisymmetric part because the commutator is antisymmetric, as you see, plus one half of its symmetric part. You can always decompose a function of two variables in an antisymmetric part and the symmetric part, of course. So this is completely fixed by the geometry. This is totally arbitrary with the exception of uh, uh, the restriction provided by the positivity. Okay? So the arbitrariness in representing the, um, the canonical commutation relation either in flat or in curved space time amounts to the arbitrariness in finding the symmetric part of the two-point function, while the anti-symmetric part is the commutator. So if you are, uh, in a way, familiar with the book of Wald, whose uh, 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 subject I intend to cover completely, so I will speak about Uru and the uh, black hole, so we are all all the arguments in there are being treated. This is correspond to what he calls mu. For those of you who have opened that book. So the, the, for, the form on the space, the, the real solution of the Klein-Gordon equation is corresponding to this symmetric part of the two-point function, which is, by the way, arbitrary. So uh, uh, arbitrary provided that you have positivity. So uh, this means that if you give yourself a Lagrangian, even a free Lagrangian, this provides the equation of motion. And the equation of motion gives to you the commutator. But S is an arbitrary symmetric function that you can add and is related to the uh, physical content of the model. It, it is not contained in the Lagrangian or in the equation of motion. It has to solve the equation of motion, but is is in, in a large measure arbitrary. So the equation of motion do not say, do not say the whole problem. In uh, studying, in studying uh, infinite dimensional systems, while if you study a finite dimensional system, a system having a finite number of degrees of freedom, the equation of motion say everything. So it is even if you think of uh, uh, some Laplacian type philosophy that the equation of motion provide everything. This is not true even in quantum field theory. Okay. So now we want to... Uh, so how, how do we choose in the enormous number of possibilities that, do, that we do have in, in uh, determining this symmetric part? Here comes this, uh, this idea of the spectral conditions. 
indeed uh, physically relevant and useful uh, quantization of three fields. Here we are talking about three fields, even if this scheme you can all, all can be generalized in a way to interacting field theory in the so-called Whiteman formalism. So you can have a representation now for a, a for a, a, a field theory which is interacting. The endpoint functions will not be factorized in terms of two-point functions. So you need to know the infinite sequence of the endpoint functions. At the n plus one point function is not determined by the end by the first n. This is the structure of an interacting quantum field theory. You can reconstruct the structure a theory if you know the the uh, set of the Whiteman function. Uh, this is uh, already an important insight. It means that uh, you really need to know just the vacuum to vacuum expectation value and not the expectation value between all the possible states of your system. But of course, as you know, this problem is, is left unsolved. We are able to construct models of quantum field theory this way in two or three dimensions. But no model has been solved in four dimensions. So, when you repeat the FOC representation? No, this is necessarily non FOC. Sorry, if you repeat in the FOC representation. In the FOC, the FOC representation, there is a, a no go theorem. The interaction representation do not exist. So, in the FOC representation, you just have three fields. Or you can turn the machine of perturbation theory. So, the interaction. The interacting fields are necessarily non FOC. You see? This is Hugg's theorem. It's a theorem of the 60s. Okay, so let's now uh, try to understand what are these uh, analytistic conditions and maybe try to uh, also make some computation using the David uh, Unru detector to associate to the analyticity properties, we are going to find their physical interpretation. The, the, so to, to uh, compare the proper representation, we haven't made a choice of maybe No, not yet. Give yourself a, a, a two-point function, and here is the quantization. At the moment, uh, if you give me a two-point function, which is which solves the functional the functional relation, this is a functional equation. You see, it's a non-differential equation. It is this is just good to characterize free the free theories. But if I have equation and an initial operator, everything I can compute depends only on commutators, right? On two-point functions. Not only, not only on the commutators, but in the two-point function, because in the annihilation operator, there is the two-point function. This is, a, this is a Hilbert space representation of the commutation relation. You see? Here you get W. W enters in the destruction. Creation is just algebraic. And destruction is integrated by your cho chosen two-point function. The GNS vacuum. So, so. This is a GNS GNS type construction. I can always put the annihilation operator on the right, and, uh, and, and all the polynomials on the right. No, there are tab W's, W's. Every time you every time you put uh, you, I mean, there are th these contractions. Phi minus phi plus is a W. So use the theorem, and you see that the endpoint functions are totally factorized. In terms of W, not of the commutator. The commutator is non positive. So if I put the on the vacuum, it will be equal to the commutator. So I can use the fact that the annihilation operator cancels, like, annihilates the vacuum to write. Well, wait, wait, it's, it's extremely simple. Mm -hmm. If you act with, to the vacuum, this is the GNS vacuum. Huh? Let's call it this way, even if this is not a. It's not a, an algebra of bounded operators. This creates 
f. And then you destroy it. You, you apply this again and you take vacuum to vacuum amplitude. Huh? So this is w f g. It's not c f g. You okay? You create f and you destroy g. And the, the scalar product is, is in terms of w. But then if you do this in the opposite way, the difference, not only on the vacuum, but on any state, is the commutator. Okay. So this is a full solution of quantization in fact space given W. The point is now is who gives to you W. So let me uh, do once more translation invariant states in Minkowski. So we are in Minkowski. So uh, if we choose translation invariant state, our uh, to try to construct all the translation invariant state in Minkowski, the commutator is going to depend on x and y this way because of, of a translation. In, the commutator is, by the way, is Lorentz invariant in any case. So it always depends on the different variable, and, but also w depends on the different variable if we do translation invariant states, okay? So if we Fourier transform this equation uh, with respect to the difference variable that I can call psi, do the Fourier transform of this, so this is e to the i p psi c of psi. This is, I, I don't care about the factors of 2 pi for the moment. D for psi, this is c of p. And because of, because of the anti-symmetry of the commutator, this is, of course, equal to minus c of minus p. Okay, so the equation is now written C of P equals W of P minus W of minus P. This is the relation that all translation invariance, invariant theories have to satisfy. So if I, there is no loss on generality in writing, W of P equals F of P, C of P. F is arbitrary, has to be determined by this equation. So if I input this ansatz here, I get, uh, C of P equal F of P C of P minus F of minus P C of minus P because of the ansatz. But I know that C of minus P is minus C of P equal F of P plus F minus p, c of p. So you see that if you have a translation invariant quantization of the uh, quantum field in Minkowski space, this is characterized by a function of the momentum variables which solves this uh, equation, this, this gives to you all the translation invariant quantization of free fields. Huh?
So the standard solution invoking the standard spectral condition is the solution that you get by this uh, if you take the heavy side step function is the function that depends just on the energy moment energy variable so it's the sign of the energy variable this is a Lorentz invariant quantity the sign of the of p0 Lorentz, proper Lorentz transformation do not interchange the future and the backward cones in momentum space. Yes? Sorry, wouldn't, wouldn't sine P0 be negative for negative P0? Excuse me? Wouldn't sine P0 be negative for negative P0? Sine of, no, I'm sorry, yes, you are right. It's not sine, it's a step. It's one and zero. If P0 is positive, and 0 if P0 is negative. And obviously, theta of P0 plus theta of minus P0 equal 1. You don't care about this point because, by the way, so you are going to multiply by delta of P square minus M square. Okay? So in this particular case, we find not only a translation invariant, uh, quantization, but also a Lorentz invariant quantization because this thing is Lorentz invariant. This is the standard splitting of the commutator C, X, and Y into W of X minus Y minus W of Y minus X, where W of X and Y minus y, let's say, is, there is this factor of 2 pi, e to the minus e k p x minus y, this is the Lorentzian product, theta p0 delta p square minus m square, while the permuted function, which is also important, is the one in which you change the sign here, which is the same as having changes the sign here, but this is, if you change the sign here, leaving this here, you can change both the sign here and this sign here and get the same thing. Okay, this is the two point function, this is the permuted two point function. So let me I just comment here to something which is a, a whole chapter in quantum field theory, but I don't have the time to explain the details. But you, let's examine the structure of this two-point function from the point of view of analytic functions. So, Because of this spectral condition, so you see, we are this quantization, this particular quantization. So if you use this, this two-point function here, let me write it as a function of the difference variable, psi, p to the minus e, p, psi, or, or either. Let me write here, c my x minus y, theta p zero, delta p square minus m square. You see, we have solved over 2 pi cube. If you plug this formula in here, this, is, this corresponds precisely to having written the standard formula. So if you Fourier transform this, introduce suitable creation and annihilation operators, this is the standard quantization of textbooks. A to the minus E, uh, Kx, A, K, 
plus e plus e k x i a dagger k d three k over uh, square root. This is square root square root of two k zero, where k zero is k square plus m square. Okay. This formula and this formula are precisely the same thing in this particular case. But uh, the point I want to, to uh, stress here is that you see this is a distribution. It's a singular object, as I showed to you uh, uh, the other uh, two lectures ago. If you put a zero here, so you compute the W of zero, this is infinite. So this integral do not converge, does not converge. Uh, in the sense of the integrals. It defines just a distribution. But you can you see here, because of this property, look at this property. So this is the mass shell, this is P space. Eh? This is the light cone in P space. This is the support of this measure. Is the mass shell with positive energy. So this is the spectral condition here. We have chosen to quantize a theory in which the vacuum is the ground state and all other states have positive energy. This is the content of the spectral condition. What is the consequence of this spectral condition? Since you don't have anything here, you see this is nothing. Look at this exponent, a to the minus e p0, uh, let's say px, I can add here an imaginary part. Psi. I can add here an imaginary part to the different variable. Okay. And if so this way, if eta is here, or if you put here a plus, you think of eta here. You see? The point is that you, you know the geometrical property. You know that the, uh, the, uh, in Minkowski space time, scalar products can have any sign. But if you take two vectors inside the, the cone, their scalar product is positive. If you take a vector in the, in the future and a second vector in the past, their scalar product is necessarily negative. Okay? So if you add here, something which is pointing backward because you have put your energy momentum in the forward cone, this thing as a, as a, uh, is negative. It's always negative. So it's going to make this integral converge as a function. So if you add here an imaginary part in the uh, backward cone, now this is an holomorphic function. Okay. And this distribution is the boundary, boundary value of this holomorphic function in the distribution sense in precisely the same way as this distribution, let's say, as the principal value of Cauchy plus or minus 2pi delta is the boundary value of this distribution. So, White band functions, if you assume positivity of the energy, are distribution. But they are a sort of distribution which came as a boundary value of uh, functions which are holomorphic. So as a consequence, let me tell you the theorem. And then we will see it in an example, rather than proving the theorem. This is true for an endpoint function. Indeed. Consider the endpoint function. They can be factorized or not. So the theory can be interacting or not. Because of this reason, because we are using the spectral condition, but you can, you can give to the spectral condition uh, an abstract meaning, meaning that the representative of space-time translations 
the spectrum is in the in the in the forward cone. These are distributions that are uh, boundary values of holomorphic functions. So these are quite regular objects, very regular objects, analytic functions. And the boundary values is, in this case, you can give, for instance, here, to x, you can give a, an imaginary part in the backward tube and to y, an imaginary part in the forward tube, in such a way that their difference, eta minus eta prime, belongs to the backward tube. Okay. So there is a theorem, which I cannot uh, even enunciate here, but the, the, uh, what you have to think, so if you think of Minkowski space, suppose this, this, this uh, line is Minkowski space, your correlation functions, on Minkowski space are distribution, but they come as boundary values in which, suppose we are thinking of uh, the two-point function, this is x, this is y, you can give an imaginary part to x if you put here the back, the, imagine this, this, this picture is, the slice is the real part, and the cone is the imaginary part. So here you have x minus e eta, let's say, where eta is minus e eta is in the backward tube, in the backward cone. This is in the forward cone. And now you have a, a distribution which is an holomorphic function. This is a consequence of the spectral condition. Not only is a consequence of the spectral condition, but it is equivalent to the spectral condition. If you give yourself a distribution which is like this way, this is a, an holomorphic function, and the distribution is the boundary value when you go to zero inside the cone. The two point function you construct has the spectral condition. The energy momentum that you construct this way is positive. So it's equivalent, it's a mathematical equivalent. Okay. Here you have this mathematical equivalence because you have Fourier space. In general, you don't have Fourier space, but you can always think <laughs> of giving little imaginary part to your uh, to your real vectors, and this will give to you a generalization of the spectral condition in curved manifolds. This is not the end of the story because once you have moved in the complex Minkowski space time, you can add with the complex uh, Lorentz group, you can add, and then with the permutation group. And it is only this way that you go to the Euclidean manifold. You see, the Schwinger functions come as restriction to the Euclidean manifold of this analytic function, but not, not the one that you get just moving to the uh, complex shift, but you have to act with the complex Lorentz group and with the permutation. So it's the extension of this manifold to a large analytic, of this two-point function to a large analytic domain, which contains the Euclidean point. So it's very, I mean, the Euclidean quantum field theory heavily relies on the spectral condition. If you don't have the spectral condition, you can start in the Euclidean world, but you stay there. There's no path to go back. So if it is really uh, closely related to this assumption, positivity of the energy uh, momentum, which has as a consequence the fact that the, two point, the endpoint functions, even if they are distribution, they are boundary value of analytic functions. And then you can act with the Lorentz complex Lorentz group and with the permutation group and get to the Euclidean manifold. Okay. Otherwise, you don't go there if you don't have this thing. So uh, maybe this is uh, a little bit abstract, but uh, I cannot say more. But if you, for instance, uh, I show you immediately one example, 
take, consider the two-point function of a massless uh, theory. How do you compute this thing? First, you use Lorentz invariance, so you use just a time variable here, and then you move in the in the backward tube. So you you, you give a, a a negative imaginary part to this. Then this integral is done just by dimensional analysis, and if you restore Lorentz invariance, in the end you get this this distribution. You see, this is an, an, an analytic function, totally analytic, but which has a cut. So it's in a cut plane of the invariant variable. It's maximally analytic. Here, uh, in, in doing this computation, I just do the computation. But I can show that this property is true for any two-point function. When you act with the Lorentz, complex Lorentz transformation plus the permutation. And the, the second important thing is that now we have constructed here W of Z, which is an holomorphic function. And the point is that the two, uh, the two determination that we have means the two-point function and the permuted two-point function are boundary values of the same W of Z. in the same order, but from different region of the tube. So this comes, the first W of X and Y is the boundary value. When you come from Z1 in the backward tube, it means that imaginary of Z1 belong to B minus, and imaginary of Z plus of Z2 belong to B plus, while the second is the imaginary of Z1 belonging to B plus, and the imaginary of Z2 belonging to B minus. Means that you, if you come on the reals with the first point from this way and the second point this way, you get W. If you come to the reals with the first point this way and the second this way, you get the permuted. So they continue each other. This is the analytic continuation of this. So this is just a summary of the world that is hidden behind the spectral condition. The standard spectral condition implies huge analyticity. Properties for the correlation function. And these analyticity properties allow to you to go to the Euclidean world, for instance. If you don't have such properties, you cannot go to the Euclidean sphere. Okay? We will see what are, what are the, uh, the um, implications from a physical down-to-earth calculation of these analyticity properties. In particular, this maximal analyticity of the two-point function, which is analytic in a cut plane this way. This is the plane of the invariant variable z square. We will see that when you look to this plane from the viewpoint of a, a Rindler observer, this will be transformed into a strip, and we will see how the temperature comes out of, of this. But really, computing transitions, we'll do it now. Okay, so uh, this uh, do not pretend to be any treatment of this thing, but uh, if you are interested, the, for instance, the Streeter and Whiteman book or the Bogolubov book, but this is uh, just application of the Laplace theorem. So this is a duality, you see. It, what is the mathematics behind this? The mathematics behind this is that when you have a, a function which has co compact support, the Fourier transform of this function is holomorphic in the whole plane, in the whole space. 
and it has fall off properties at infinity which are related to the size of the thing. This is uh, uh, the so called Pale Wiener theorem. When you have function or distribution which are supporting a cone, okay, like is the case when you have the spectral condition, what say the spectral condition? Spectral condition says that the Fourier transform of your distributions in P space have support in the energy momentum cone, the uh, uh, Fourier transform of this, again, like in this, in this case, you have maximal analyticity. In this case, you have the, the, the two-point function Fourier transformed are holomorphic in uh, complexification of your manifold in which you attach a cone which is dual to this. So this is the pale wiener schwarz theorem. Because the name is Schwarz is there because we are thinking of distribution, not of function. So support properties in P space, analyticity property in X space. Okay? And this is the, uh, the way to go to the Euclidean world. For instance, okay. Now let's let's do something more concrete. I wanted to go. My my aim is to construct this way the KMS states. Okay. So sorry, did you did you say the z squared has a branch cut? One over. This is the z squared plane, and our function is on oh, on yeah, Sorry, I thought you meant z squared. No, no, this is the z squared plane. This is the two point function in the massless case, and there is a pole here, and you cut this way. And the cut is what is representing the cut is representing the locality. Oh, oh sorry. The cut is this way. That's quite positive. Let's come again down to earth. So uh, I uh, this this solution f p plus f minus t equal to uh, one, this is the question, theta p0 is one solution, an obvious solution, but you can also consider f of p in the form alpha theta p0 minus b, let's say, theta of minus p0. Also in this class, you find, uh, you find uh, solution which are Lorentz invariant. And now you see that here A and B have to satisfy the restriction A minus B equals 1 if you want to solve this, this relation. So you can call this A cos alpha and this square and this B sinh alpha square. And you construct similarly a two-point function. And if you do the construction, you see that W alpha is something like cos where alpha w of x and y plus sin square alpha, the permuted one. You can call this vacua that are there. They, uh, they give a mathematically acceptable quantization. If you construct the field with this uh, uh, two-point function, of course, this, this quantization is fucked, but not reducible. But the point is that, so you can call this thing the alpha vacua, because they are really the analogous in a way to the alpha vacua of the De Sitter case, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. What is, uh, why they are not acceptable here? Because if you look at the spectrum, you have uh, uh, the positive energy, but also the negative energy here. But the negative energy is not 
damped. I mean, they are just multiplied by this constant. So negative energy here enter with always the same uh, weight, you see. So this vacuum is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, mathematically acceptable, but is unstable because uh, you have uh, negative energy in an unaccept unacceptable way. Okay, these are Lorentz invariant. They do not satisfy the spectral condition. And they cannot be accepted because of a, a problem relating to negative energy. But we can solve the same and that's in a more wise way. So the wise way to do it is this. One, f of p, try this. It is easy to see, and we already saw last time, that this satisfies the condition. So, because of what we said, we are guaranteed that uh, the two-point function that we get with this, uh, uh, with this function f defined this way where we define the two-point function this way, is a translation invariant quantization of a Klein-Gordon field. You can check positivity of this two-point function. So what it is the two-point function? Let me write the two-point function. Let's work on this. So the only thing we need to check is positivity. But positivity is obvious, and I leave it to you as an exercise. So suppose we have checked positivity. It is true. So we end with this two-point function. W of x and y, which is indeed W beta of x minus y, okay, equal 1 over 2 pi cubed, uh, e to the minus k x minus y, epsilon p0 over 1 minus e beta p0, Delta, delta p square minus p square minus m square. Okay. This is the two point function. You can check a posteriori. So you see it depends on beta. But if you compute the commutator, the commutator does not. And it is the commutator we have started with. Positivity, you can check it. Yes? Or should I change the P? Excuse me? Should I change the P? K, sorry, P. Supposed to be here. P or K are interchangeable. Unfortunately, I have this. So, what have we do this way? Uh, these are the famous KMS states. No, I will go, go to spend the rest of this lecture to examine the properties of the states. They are, uh, uh, they are uh, describing a quantum field in equilibrium with a reservoir at temperature 1 over beta. Okay. You see, there is no spectral condition either here. So we have the positive energies and the negative energy, but there is a, a, a function which is uh, exponentially decreasing in the energy, in the negative energy. And why uh, now this state can be acceptable? Because now, because it, go, it is going to describe uh, an equilibrium state, 
So you have a reservoir. And because of the reservoir, you don't need the spectral condition. Because it's the, it's the reservoir which is taking care of absorbing any fluctuation towards the negative energies. Okay? So, uh, but uh, uh, all these things uh, are not uh, uh, at all clear at the moment. So I have to uh, make a digression about, in general, what the KMS states are. Uh, do you know this? states, or uh, not at all, or I'm telling things which you know very well. Hmm? By the way, this is also useful for uh, quantum information theory. So I want to, uh, to show uh, that these are KMS states, and then we try to explore uh, the, the physical content of the vacuum from another point of view by using the DeWitt uh, detector. Okay, let's do the two things. One which is mathematical, the other which is a down-to-earth computation. So first thing, what are the KMS states? If you think, what are the Gibbs states in quantum mechanics? Consider a quantum mechanical system which is in a box. Suppose the number of particles is fixed and the Hamiltonian is H. Okay. Gibbs states are density matrix that you construct by using the, uh, the Hamiltonian of your system. So the density matrix uh, beta is the, uh, applied to an operator A is the trace of e to the minus beta h a over the trace of e to the minus beta h. Okay? This is the definition of what a Gibbs state. Here I'm putting the system in a box, and I have a definite number of particles inside, but I can generalize this to the grand canonical system by adding here the chemical potential, but I don't want to enter in this kind of uh, distinction, so it's pointless for us. Uh, so Gibbs states are described this way. The, uh, the um, crucial, uh, this way of characterizing the Gibbs states do not go over in the thermodynamical limit because the energy per particle is non-zero at finite temperature, when you take the, 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 the thermodynamical limit, this thing is, is not, it's not defined, because the H is not trace class anymore. You cannot take the class, the, the traces. These things as problem when you remove the, the box. But you can characterize this object by using uh, two properties uh, which are very simple to be shown by using this concrete. Uh, yes? A is a quantum observable. Whatever it is, is an operator in the bounded operators in the Hilbert space. And if you multiply an operator A by an operator which is trace class, you can take the trace. I mean, if this has a trace, also this has a trace, you can compute it. So uh, what are the, uh, how can we characterize this, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, state? There are two crucial properties. Define two functions. So the first thing you need to observe is that uh, KMS states are, equi uh, give states are equilibrium states. So if you consider the time evolved of A, which is e to the IHT A, e to the minus IHT, okay, it is obvious that rho beta of alpha T of A is equal to rho beta of A, because 
this is this is trace of e to the minus beta h e to the i h t a uh, e to the minus i h t the trace is cyclic you can put this here and since a uh, this commute with this you can pass this here and this goes away and you are back to this okay so these states are equilibrium states in the sense the expectation value of the time the world is the same of the expectation value of the initial thing. The second property, it is the crucial property that we are going to check on that, on that expression is the KMS property. If you consider now, to, you can construct to yourself two operators A and B. Construct two expectation value. One is f of t, which is rho beta, let's say trace, trace of e to the minus beta h, b alpha t of a. Let me, uh, I'm always intending divided by trace over e to the minus beta h. I don't write this denominator. And the second is the permuted one. It's exactly as we do in quantum field theory. Trace of e to the minus beta h alpha t of a, the time evolved of a, times b. Okay, these are the two quantities you need to consider. What says the KMS, uh, KMS theory, the KMS property, is there are two statements. This is uh, indeed the boundary value of a function which is holomorphic in a strip, okay, Z, where imaginary of z is in between 0 and beta. This is the boundary value of an holomorphic function, which is holomorphic in the opposite strip, minus beta, imaginary z, 0. And they are, they are, there is a periodicity condition that tells you that f of t plus e beta equals g of t. This is one statement. These are functions which are holomorphic in strips. One is holomorphic in the strips that go from 0 to beta, f. The second is holomorphic in the strip that go from minus beta to 0, g. And if you take the boundary value of f on this line, this coincides on g on this line. These are the KMS properties. And the KMS theorem tells that these properties are equivalent to the fact such a state is uniquely determined this way. If you have a state that satisfies the KMS properties, it is stationary. And you can reconstruct the Hamiltonian in such a way that the state is the trace of such thing. This is the statement of the KMS theorem. It is very simple in data. Huh? It is not, nothing complicated to be proven. Uh, let us just see rapidly our work, the, the, the first properties. So consider the first function. You have f, let's say, of t plus e gamma. Okay, this is trace of e to the minus beta h. t plus e gamma is e to the i t plus e gamma 
uh, B. A e to the minus e t plus e gamma. Okay. Permuting. I put the, this wood block. I put this here. Trace. So I get e to the h h. Am I right in writing this way? Excuse me. Let me check my notes. I think I take the wrong notebook. Okay, no, I, I do the other, the other way around. I put this here by cyclicity of the, of the trace. Okay, so what, is, what you see here, you see B e to the minus gamma H at T because, okay, A to the I H T, A, A to the minus I H T, and then you get e to the minus beta minus gamma h. So you can compute this trace as long as this number here is negative and this number here is also negative. This means that you can compute this trace when gamma goes from zero to beta. Okay. So the trace, so this way you prove that this function is indeed holomorphic in this strip, imaginary Z. This is because you have here the Hamiltonian and because the temperature is minus beta. So it's a characterization of the fact that you have this minus beta here. It's beta, the inverse temperature. Same thing is for the other this, the same way you can prove by interchanging, uh, by interchanging, and and now let's compute what it is, uh, f of t plus e beta. F of t plus e beta. Okay. This is trace e to the minus beta h by a i t plus e beta. I'm taking the, the boundary value on the upper strip h a a to the minus e t plus e beta. Uh, there's a b here. Okay, now we are going to permute and put this here. This is going to be trace H. Okay. This is going to be, put this here. So this is uh, um, A to the I T plus E beta. H, okay, A, A to the minus E, T plus E beta, H, so I put this thing, E to the minus beta H, B, okay, I have taken this block here. Now let's do let's do the, the uh, this is e to the minus beta 
h e to the i t h a and then I have here a to the minus e t h a to the beta h e to the minus beta h that goes away b and this is precisely g of t. So these two properties I have proven the direct way the theorem. Suppose you have a state this way, it has these two properties. The opposite is also true. Give yourself a state which has the two, these two properties, it is written this way. So the KMS properties fully characterize the Gibbs state in quantum mechanics. Okay. What does it mean? I mean, now you give yourself a state which is such that omega of uh, uh, beta alpha t of alpha is holomorphic in the strip, and omega of alpha t alpha b, alpha t a b is holomorphic in the other strip, and they are exchanged by these properties. Then you can reconstruct H in such a way that rho is written this way. So this theorem characterizes the KMS states in quant for quantum systems, but uh, it is also a characterization of relativistic KMS states, means that even if when you cannot define these things, you can work uh, in terms of uh, functions which can be continued in the imaginary time variable in such a way that this periodicity condition is respected. We are going to check that this is true for that expression. Okay? So we will characterize the now we will characterize the mathematical aspect of the KMS condition. And then I put a, a Uru detector at rest in this va vacuum, GNS vacuum. And I will see that this is a, a, a thermal, a thermal uh, distribution of quanta of the field. So the states are the quantization of this Klein-Gordon equation with the right commutation relation, not in the vacuum, but in a thermal equilibrium state. Okay, five minutes of rest.
Once more, our two-point function is the Fourier transform of this measure. The measure depends on the temperature here, you see? And the negative energy are exponentially suppressed, while positive energy normally in enter more or less normally in the uh, hard part of the spectrum when the energy is very high, you don't see any temperature. Okay? So uh, I want to show the KMS property. You can do directly on this, on this formula, show that this formula provides for you something which is analytic in a strip, compute the permuted and this analytic in the opposite strip, and verify the KMS uh, condition. But as a, 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 also a, gl a glimpse in the direction of the so-called imaginary time formalism of thermal quantum field theory, we can do this way. Let's write the measure by splitting the positive energy part and the negative energy part. You see I change the sign here, put a plus, and change the uh, denominator and put an absolute value of the, of the uh, energy P0 because if minus P0 is positive, okay? And now, since this, is, uh, this number is smaller than one, I can develop it as a, as a power, not, not a power, as a the series of one or one or minus X is the sum of Xn. Okay, and the same for this part. <coughs> We're putting this this way. So I write this expression and this expression as series. This series here go from one to infinity. Because when I do, uh, I do uh, again this. I have to put here one more of this. So if we input that series in the two-point function, we see that the two-point function, so I have shifted. This is now the standard you will see here. Here this, there is no more uh, the one over beta. It has been changed in this series here, you see? So this is what, what is this? This is the vacuum two-point function. As I told you before, it is analytic in the backward tube. So we are shifting it in imaginary time this way. And we are summing over all these copies. You see, this part gives for you the sum. This is the vacuum two-point function. T minus E beta N, beta is the inverse temperature, N are the integer. I sum this from zero to infinity. So this is the first part. And the part corresponding to the negative energies, I'm shifting the permuted function in the opposite way. I copied wrong, probably. You can verify. I will send you the notes as, as usually, so you can verify all the steps. So the, uh, the, the point is that we can now write that uh, two-point function as two infinite, the sum of two infinite series. Okay. So let's now compute the permuted one. Same thing. Now, so these are uh, the shifted in the you, the first point in, in the, two point, the vacuum two-point function, the first point can have always an imagi a negative imaginary part in time, and the second point can have a positive imaginary part in time. So I shift the imaginary part in time, all the frequencies <coughs> beta n, and the second all by permuting, okay? Now I use the translation invariance of these expressions. And I put this minus E beta here, 
becomes a plus C beta here because it's translation invariant. So it depends on the difference between this and this. So this is equal to this. And this is equal to this. And you are going to see that this is precisely equal to this expression with the exception that now the first series goes from, uh, the first series, which is this, goes from 1 to infinity, and the second series, which is this, comes from 0 to infinity. And this is equivalent to having shifted the imaginary time of minus e beta. Because I, if I think of this like the sum of t minus e beta minus e beta n, n going from 0 to infinity, I'm back in the previous definition. Okay? So it's extremely simple. It's just a developing uh, a power in power 1 over 1 minus x. I'll send you the notes. You can check the steps. But you see that you have shown that this is equal to this. So this is the uh, relativistic analog of permuting this and this by going <coughs> to the boundary value on the opposite tree. Okay. So at least from a mathematical viewpoint, this two-point function has the property, the KMS <coughs> property, and we expect that it describes uh, uh, it describes a quantum field in equilibrium with a thermal bath. Okay. Now I'm going to test this interpretation by using the unruh de Witt detector. So we model a detector, we put it in, the, in, the, in this equilibrium state and see what it measures. Okay, so this will open the road. I hope to do it today even to a first derivation of the Unruh effect. Are there questions here? This, I, I, I ask you to check the calculation in the notes. It's extremely simple, but if I do every step here, I lose time. But I send you the notes today. So let's model our detector and see what, what it measures. It measures. You know very well this oversimplified model of what a detector is. Our root de Witt detector is a word line. A word line, x mu of tau, parameterized with its own proper time. And over in this word line, there is a, a a quantum system which is uh, traveling and he has uh, several energy levels. He can make transition in these energy levels by exciting or de exciting by taking quanta from the state is going to explode. Okay. So, no, we want to uh, describe the interaction of a quantum field. And here, I think, I mean a field which satisfies the commutation relation of Klein-Gordon, but which is represented in some state. Okay, so it's a Hilbert space representation. So we are going to test what is the physical content, one possible test, on what is the physical content of the two-point function. Okay. How do we couple this, uh, these uh, systems? There is the Hamiltonian of the field, the Hamiltonian of the detector, the free Hamiltonian, and the coupling which is a monopole coupling. M is an operator describing this coupling relative to the, uh, uh, the detector. And you consider the point-like field 
on the trajectory. Of course, as you know, this is not really possible, and indeed we are going to face divergences in this calculation. But still, this is the way we do it. Yes? All right. <coughs> M is a monopole moment of this technique. Yes. <coughs> so, uh, calculations here are done by cal computing the transition amplitudes <coughs> by using the so called Fermi Golden Rule. Okay? We do, we do make a computation. So, we, we study a transition between an initial state, the Hilbert space being the tensor product of the Hilbert space of the field plus times the, the Hilbert space of the detectors, which is with these internal states, we are going to uh, um, compute a transition initial, final. Okay. So, uh, in first order in perturbation theory, this you can find this formula in Mestia book or uh, any other book you like most. I don't know which is your reference book. At first order, the transition is written in the interaction picture. Lambda is the coupling constant. Then you have uh, the states. Let's call F the final state of the detector, CF the final state of the field, and then you have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity with respect to the proper time, d tau, of the uh, interaction Hamiltonian, means M of tau, P of X of tau. What is m of tau? m of tau is e to the i h0, the free, the free part of the Hamiltonian of the detector, and e to the minus e h uh, tau, 0, okay. times acting on the initial state of the field and the detector. This is the transition amplitude EF at first order in perturbation theory. Okay, so uh, if you now uh, input this here and act on the states of the of the detector by computing their uh, um, time evolution, you end up with minus i lambda f m e and then you get here the exponent of e f minus e e tau because you have acted with this operator on the states and they are supposed to be eigenstates of the energy of the detector times the expectation value of the field. This is the operator, these are states. Between the initial and the final state of the state, of the field, okay? This is the transition uh, between the initial and the final state of the system, which is uh, field plus uh, detector, but you want to sum up over the possible final state of the field, because you just want to know what is the probability of transition between an initial and the final state of the detector. Okay, this means squaring this thing and integrating over all the final states. Integrating over all the final states it means having put here the identity operator and the, the answer. So if you square this, you get the total probability of transition.
the total probability of transition P EF where all the final states of the field are being integrated is lambda square the square of this and here you get so if I call omega this quantity omega is the difference between the final energy and the initial energy of the uh, detector it is going to be times an integral e to the minus omega tau minus tau prime the initial state of the field c of x of tau c of x of tau prime the initial state of the field okay i have squared this quantity so when i square this quantity i get here another copy of this p of f p of x of tau and here I have tau prime because two integrals. And then I integrate over the intermediate state. Okay. So what it is, this is the trajectory. You are in a certain state and you compute the correlation between two points on the trajectories. So this is a two-point correlation function. It's not a vacuum correlation function. It's a correlation function in a state. Okay. And you are computing this Fourier transform of this quantity. This is uh, known as the response function. If you have the uh, some two-point function, if you compute the two-point uh, function, but on a trajectory, which you call a detector, then you compute its Fourier transform. It is called the, the response function of the detector in case in which the state phi is uh, an eigenstate of the moment of the energy momentum so it is translation invariant of course we are in mean cost not translation invariant it acts it has uh, an uh, uh, an again value is an eigenstate of the translations this is going to be equal show this as an exercise there is this quantity which I put in here, and this is going to be equal to e to the minus e omega tau minus tau prime times pi of t x tau minus x tau prime p of zero. Yeah. Okay. So you see that one integration in in, uh, in 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 tau you integrate over the two variables. One integration is going to diverge. The solution because it uh, does, does not depend on two on two variables, but only on one variable. This quantity in general. So when you integrate over tau minus tau prime, you get something times the integral of the time, and this is here. Uh, the idea, but this is a provisional solution. In a way, this is, has been invented by, I don't know who, Max Born or Enrico Fermi. You compute probability per unit time. And this is supposed to be a probability, but still diverges. Okay. But if you divide by this time, this time variable, so you are going to compute this quantity in the end, e to the minus e omega tau, your state, let's say the vacuum, your reference state, phi of x of tau, phi of zero, your state. Okay, this is the quantity to be computed. And this will be multiplied by this number, lambda square. F M I 
the Swiss Express, the probability of transition I to F per unit time. Okay. So now we are going to compute this thing for our vacua. Three calculations we do. What happens in the standard vacuum? What happens in the thermal vacuum? And what happens in the standard vacuum when we look at it from an, a viewpoint of an accelerating observer? Okay, let's do it. So let's do uh, directly what happens in the thermal vacuum, because in the standard vacuum, it happens a trivial thing. It happens the following thing. If you're, if you're, uh, do it. So in the standard vacuum, what you do, first you parameterize your trajectory by the proper time. So put your detector at rest in the origin. We are looking at inertial observer for the moment, okay? So you parameterize your, uh, your uh, um, uh, trajectory just with the proper time, if the forward velocity is constant. Then uh, if you compute this Fourier transform of a standard two-point function, take for instance the massless or a massive uh, two-point function whose Fourier transform is this one, you have a theta p0 here, delta p square minus m square. Compute this Fourier transform, you will see, it is obvious, but you can check it in the computation, that if you start from, uh, uh, if you want to consider a transition this way, that uh, uh, produces a final states of the uh, detector, such that the final energy is higher than the initial energy, the rate is zero. This does not happen. But the, the opposite way can happen, and this transition is possible, uh, provided that uh, uh, it can excite one particle of mass m. <coughs> so it's possible if uh, this difference between this level is bigger than the mass of the field. This is what you expect. Okay. Let's see what happens in the... Uh, in the uh, thermal vacuum. So the two-point function of the thermal vacuum, once more, it helps to remember it this way, writing it many times integral e to the minus e p x minus y epsilon p zero delta p square minus m square. Okay. So what we have to compute, we want to compute this Fourier transform. e to the minus e omega t of this, where we have put our observer at rest in the origin. So, this means that I adjust E. The second point is zero, you see here. And the first point, point is just tau. This is E P0, minus P0 tau, epsilon P zero delta p square minus m square d for p. This quantity will tell, we will tell us what is uh, seen by an inertial observer in this state. There is no more white chalk here. So this is a, 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 a extremely simple calculation. This is divided by 2p cubed. If we really want numbers and see what is a thing. Let's do first the tau integration. The tau integration is 2 pi. 
so I get 1 over 2 pi square delta of omega plus p0. Do you have any comments? Uh, sorry, yes, sure. 1 a minus beta p0. Sure. Otherwise, this is even not positive. <laughs> sorry. So the tau, do first the tau integration. And then you can do second. The P0 integration. So the P0 integration gives that you write here, act as if it were uh, a function. So this is 1 over 2 pi square epsilon minus omega over 1 minus e minus beta omega plus beta omega d3 e delta p square minus m square. Okay. We already have the answer because this integral over p does not depend on omega. But if we want to go up to the end, we can also do this little integral here. So if I go to uh, radial coordinates, this is going to be a 4 pi. So I have 1 over pi, and then I have uh, epsilon minus omega, which came out of the integral, 1 minus a to the b omega, beta omega, because it's minus omega here. This is already the rate, huh? times the integral p square delta of p square plus m square minus omega square dp. Okay. Sorry, should that be a, is that a plus beta it's omega in the denominator or minus beta? Plus, plus. You also have a minus here and delta is delta of omega plus p0. So this is uh, uh, written one half delta p square plus m square minus omega square square root of p square dp square. And this is just square root of omega square minus m square, one over two pi epsilon minus omega, one over a beta omega. This is the times i m f square gamma square. This is the rate of transition e, e plus omega. Okay. Now you can do, so this is something you see depends on the mass. You don't care, it goes simplified when you, when you compute the rates. So if you compute now the ratio, the probability of going from E to E plus omega over the probability of going of E plus omega to E, because of this denominator, you get that this is simply e to the minus beta omega, the Boltzmann distribution. So your detector will be in equilibrium 
with this field if the energy levels are populated according to the Boltzmann distribution. Okay. It's as simple as that. Just compute one Fourier transform. Now, if you allow me, since we'll not we'll not have Monday lecture, because it's Thanksgiving, thanks God, I can do in ten minutes the same calculation looking at the vacuum from the viewpoint of an accelerating observer. <laughs> and this will give to us precisely the same rate. And so this is one way to say that an accelerating observer sees a thermal bath in the vacuum. Okay, because while accelerating, it can, ex it can exchange uh, his level get populated according to uh, the Boltzmann distribution. In, in the calculation of the same effect in the Unruh Findler coordinates, what happens is that you see concretely why the periodicity condition that we have just showed are important because I did this calculation explicitly, but I could have done it just using the analyticity properties by deforming the integral on this contour, pushing it on this contour. You see? And this, because of the periodicity in imaginary time, make precisely this factor appearing. You see? That's why the uh, analyticity property in imaginary time is related to the temperature. Okay, because it makes uh, it makes uh, in appearing into the into the play the Boltzmann factors. Okay. Do you want me to do it now, or we'll do it the first thing, uh, the first, and we do maybe a little supplementary lecture, lecture on Friday, because you should do four more lectures. But one is killed by Thanksgiving. What should we do? We are tired, or we can do it a quarter of an hour more. Depends on you. My take. Huh? With now? OK. So uh, let's do now. Uh, model use the same the same thing to discuss what is it I don't, I don't take any. So, uh, okay. To do this in the in the uh, in the Rindler coordinates, let's do it. So now our our uh, detector is no more an inertial observer, it is a, uh, an accelerating observer, okay? This is the wedge, and we can parameterize it in terms of its proper acceleration in this way. This is our, and y and z is zero. This is our observer. Okay. Now, because of Lorentz invariance in this case, again we are uh, we are uh, led to uh, one integral which is just infinite, 
and the second one we ask to be computed. And we are going to use the massless two-point function W uh, X let's say and Y or Z. Okay. This is minus one over pi square, one over z square. This is the massless two point function written in x space this time. Okay. Z is x minus y. X minus y. So we are going to compute the Fourier transform A minus E omega tau of the vacuum phi of x tau phi of x zero the vacuum okay so we need to uh, uh, express this scalar product x tau is this and x zero we can by the way easily compute uh, the invariant x tau minus x tau prime square and you can uh, easily see that this is 4 or rather 1 over 4 or 4 so this is uh, we can do it but I, I prefer not to do it in the Rindler coordinates. Yes, over two. Extremely important, the over two here. Com make this easy computation. You have, I'm sure you have done it many times. If you use this coordinatization for two points, you get this, the distance between these two points is expressed this way. And you see it depends just on t minus tau, tau minus tau prime. So one integral is diverging, infrared diverging. And so we are going to compute the Fourier transform of this function. is e to the minus e omega t tau from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then we have uh, uh, minus one over four pi square. And then we have one over this thing gives a, a square here and uh, uh, four hyperbolic sine of tau alpha a tau over two minus the epsilon because we are in the Whiteman vacuum. This is minus the epsilon is the sign of the positivity of energy. Okay. So this is the integral we need to compute. And now uh, we examine the situation. We are doing it on the, on the real t coordinates. There is a pole here. <laughs> no, here. This is periodic. In, Im in imaginary time, okay, periodicity is uh, uh, in tau is two. Hyperbolic sine of x is periodicity. Uh, the is periodicity in imaginary time is ip, but because of this uh, over two, is two ip, the periodicity in imaginary time of the hyperbolic sine. So we get another uh, little pole. Here, this is two i p 
alpha tau over 2 equal to p, tau equal 2i p over a. Okay. So there is a singularity here and no other singularities. This is decreasing at space like infinity, so we are going to compute the uh, the uh, integral over this strip by computing also another copy of it on this strip. Okay, and the copy of it on this strip is is going to be multiplied here by the Boltzmann factor. Okay. So if you do this computation, compute the integral this way, okay, and recognize that the integral over this line is the same as the integral over this one, multiplied by a to the minus exponential factor, which is appropriate. So we get by using, uh, so we have a double toll here. Let's, let's do the computation. Since we have a double pole, this integral is the residue of the derivative of this function. Okay, once, if you develop the hyperbolic sign, the a square goes away with this a square. The four happens here and is simplified with this. And then uh, um, you have a double pole at the denominator. And the double pole means that when you do the contour integral, you are going to t to obtain one over two pi i two pi i times the derivative of this. Okay, so the result is the integral. So we are going to do this integral. This is going to be the integral over a minus e omega tau a square over 16 pi square hyperbolic sine of alpha tau over 2 minus i epsilon. This is this integral here. This is, does not count. This is, does not count. Now I have this integral here with the minus sign. The phase, since I'm going to the line 2i p over a, times this minus i is e to the 2 pi a, 2 pi omega over a, and the same thing, e to the minus e omega t a square over 16 pi square hyperbolic sine a t minus i epsilon, okay? This is the residue of the function inside. So this is 2 pi i, because I didn't put the 1, one, one over 2 pi i here. The derivative of, of this function, and the derivative of this function is just minus i omega, by the, the derivative with respect to tau, times the constant that comes out from uh, developing this uh, hyperbolic sign, and you can check this constant is 1 over 4 pi square, because the a gets cancelled, and the final result is omega over 2 pi. So, if you recollect the thing, this plus this, you say that this integral is going to be the integral we want to compute here, is going to be omega over 2 pi times 1 over 1 a 2 pi omega minus 1. Because there is a global minus sign in the definition of the two-point function. So this is minus the integral we wanted to compute. 
to pi omega over a minus 1. So if you go and make the same consideration we did before, you see that rate probability e into e plus omega over probability e plus omega into e, e, e to the minus 2 pi omega over A, and so this is the temperature your detector sees. And this is also a, an example of a general thing. And this thing is also true in, uh, in interacting quantum field theory because of the bisognano wittmann theorem. So here we are used one extremely simple thing. If you don't want to do this computation, you want to examine the thing just from the viewpoint of the uh, geometry. The point is that this function, 1 over z square, is a function which has a cut here, in a cut plane. You go to the Rindler coordinates, you get 1 over sine square of something. But this is just a geometrical fact. If you look at this cut plane from the point of view of those coordinates, this cut plane is going to become a strip. A strip whose size is 2 pi over a. That's the geometrical fact. And this is true also in interacting quantum field theory. You can show that if you look at a white one quantum field theory uh, in the vacuum, interacting, but in the vacuum state, from a viewpoint of an accelerating observer, in the end you can construct a, an operator which is called the modular operator, and you see everything is like, if you restrict your, your field algebra to the wedge, because what we are doing indeed in, this, in doing this is that instead of looking of all the field algebra, we are just looking at the field algebra supported in this wedge. And doing this, with respect to this time translation, the point is that the vacuum is changed into a KMS state. Yeah. This is a general geometrical fact that do not depend on the details of the computation I've done. But it's true that looking at this computation renders the thing more concrete. Okay, but it's a general geometrical fact, plus, this is crucial, the analyticity <coughs> property I explained to you. Because geometry in itself cannot very much. It is the geomet geometry of the wedge plus the spectrum of the energy. Okay. This is, and, and all those theorems of, uh, that you always uh, maybe have heard, cited, in many contexts, like the PCT symmetry, the PCT symmetry is true only if you assume the positivity of the energy, otherwise it is not true. 